Hello everyone. Now the topic for discussion is retention and relapse. What exactly the term retention and relapse means? According to Moyers, retention means maintaining the newly moved teeth in position long enough to aid in stabilizing their correction. And relapse is nothing but loss of any correction achieved by orthodontic treatment. There are four schools of retention. They are the occlusion school, the apical base school, the mandibular incisor school and the musculature school. The occlusion school actually is given by Kingsley and he says that proper occlusion should be achieved and it has to be maintained because it is a potent factor in maintaining the stability of a corrected malocclusion. The apical base school was given by Alex Lundstrom, Macaulay and Nance. According to Alex Lundstrom, Apical base have to be taken into consideration while doing orthodontic treatment and it is it should be even taken into consideration while uh, during the retention phase of after the orthodontic therapy. To this, Macaulay have added that intercanine and intermolar width have to be maintained throughout the orthodontic treatment. That means they shouldn't be altered to a greater extent. And to this, Nance have added that arch length should not be permanently altered. The mandibular incisor school. The mandibular incisor school was given by Greaves and Tweed. And they said that the stability of a treated malocclusion can be increased if the lower incisors are placed upright or a little bit slightly retroclined over the basal bone. The last is nothing but the musculature school. The musculature school was given by Rogers. And according to Rogers, proper muscle balance is very much important to maintain the stability of, of corrected malocclusion. According to Rogers, if there is muscular imbalance, then even after doing orthodontic therapy, because of abnormal musculature, it will again pose or result in the occurrence of relapse. There are a number of causes of relapse. We will see each and every one of them in detail. First coming to periodontal ligament traction. See, whenever a force is applied during orthodontic therapy to a particular tooth, the tooth usually gets moved from one place to another. As it moves, the surrounding principal fibers of the periodontal ligament and the supracrusal fibers of the gingiva also get stretched. Now these fibers are usually again trying to recoil back and return the teeth to its original position. The principal fibers of the periodontal ligament takes about 4 weeks of time to reorganize themselves to a new position whereas the supracrustal fibers of the gingiva take about 40 weeks of time to reorganize and adapt to a new environment. So retention has to be maintained for prolonged duration of time like at least complete day, complete day and night wear of the retainer at least for 6 months followed by use of the retainer for remaining 6 months on a reduced basis. Because if the retainer is not used then these fibers will again recoil because of the elasticity and result in again occurrence of the relapse of the malacclusion. Second is relapse due to growth related changes. This is particularly more important in case of class 2 cases, class 3 cases, open bite and deep bite. If the malocclusion correction or uh, it's done at an early ages and we are expecting that abnormal growth will still continue, the retainers have to be maintained. If not, this will pose or the result in the occurrence of relapse of the cases if abnormal growth continues. Next is bone adaptation. See, whenever a tooth is moved within the bone, as the tooth moves to a new, uh, new area or a new place in the bone, it is usually covered by means of a less calcified bone. This bone takes place some duration of time, some months like that wherein remodeling takes place and the bone becomes not dense calcified. So hence the bone should be given sufficient amount of time so that it should get calcified. Initially, the bony trabeculae are arranged perpendicular to the long axis of the tooth. But when the orthodontic forces are applied, the trabeculae becomes parallel to the direction of the application and during the retention phase, they again return back to the original position. So the bone should be given sufficient amount of time to reorganize. Next is muscular forces. Abnormal muscular forces should be intercepted. If abnormal muscle forces are acting uh, uh, on the dentition, then it will result in the occurrence of relapse. Failure to eliminate the original cause. Now, let us take an example here. Uh, in case uh, a patient comes to us with severe anterior proclination and open bite. Generally, we speaking, we say this, the patient is having anterior proclination and there is spacing. We can correct it by automatic treatment. But if we look into the etiology, this proclination and spacing is actually occurring because of abnormal tongue posture. The patient is having tongue thrust habit. So this tongue thrust habit has to be intercepted. If this tongue thrust habit is, is not intercepted, it's not corrected and orthodontic treatment is done and the patient still continues to swallow or thrust uh, uh, and have this continuous tongue thrust habit, this will again result in the occurrence of same proclination and spacing. There is nothing but a relapse of the case. 
So failure to eliminate original cause is a blunder. The original cause have to be intercepted if it is a habit, anything. It has to be first intercepted and then the orthodontic treatment should be continued. Next is role of third molars. Third molars generally erupt at an age of 18 to 21 years of age group. If the orthodontic treatment is completed before the eruption of third molars and then after the completion of orthodontic treatment, third molars erupt, then they usually uh, pushes the teeth in an anterior direction while they are erupting and this will result again in the occurrence of crowding or the relapse. Next is role of occlusion. As I have already mentioned that Kingsley also stressed on this point that occlusion is a potent factor in maintaining stability. Proper occlusion have to be achieved before winding up of the case. There should be tight contacts. There should be good interdigitation between the upper and the lower teeth. Theories of retention. Actually, nine theorems has been given by Riedel. To this, a tenth theorem has been added by Moyle. So, total there are ten theories of retention. The first theorem states that teeth that have been recently moved tend to return back to their former position. As I've already mentioned that as the teeth are surrounded by means of a number of fibers, periodontal ligament fibers, gingival fibers, they usually are very elastic in nature. So when the tooth is moved, these fibers get stretched and they again try to recoil back to their original position. And while doing so, the teeth again return back to its original position. So the teeth that have been recently moved tend to return back to their former position. This have to be kept in mind. The second theorem states that elimination of the cause of malocclusion will prevent the occurrence of relapse. As I have said that first the etiological factor have to be sought out. What is the etiological factor behind the occurrence of malocclusion? It has to be corrected first. The third theorem states that malocclusion should always be overcorrected to be on the safety factor. Many authors uh, suggest this that malocclusion should be overcorrected because some amount of relapse usually is quite natural to occur. So if it is overcorrected, this is usually a good sign that relapse will not extend to a major uh, relapse will not go to a major extent the fourth theorem states that proper occlusion is a potent factor in holding the teeth in their corrected position if a proper good interdigitation between upper and lower teeth has been achieved during orthodontic therapy then this itself acts as a very good retention and this will prevent again occurrence of relapse the fifth theorem states that bone and adjacent tissue must be allowed or given sufficient amount of time to reorganize themselves now since the bone is a calcified tissue, when the tooth is moved, it first the direction towards which the tooth is moved, the resorption occurs. And the site from where the tooth has been moved, the deposition takes place. Now this is nothing but remodeling. So hence the, it takes time for the bone to reorganize itself and becomes dense calcified. So it should be given sufficient amount of time so that the crab could reorganize themselves uh, and achieve and the, and the teeth usually be stable at their corrected position. Sixth theorem states that if the lower incisors are placed upright or slightly retroclined over the basal bone, there are more chances for the stability to be there. The seventh theorem states that corrections which are carried out during the periods of growth, there, there will be more stable and there will be less chances for the relapse to occur. The theorem eight states that the farther the teeth are moved, the lesser are the chances for the relapse. As simple to understand that if a tooth is moved from here till here, more chances for the of, there are the more chances for the relapse to again for this teeth to go back to its original position. But when the tooth is moved to a greater distance, it will usually take uh, it is usually a bit difficult for the teeth to again return back to its former position. So the farther the teeth is moved, the lesser are the chances for the occurrence of relapse. Theorem 9 states that arch form, particularly the mandibular arch, cannot be permanently altered by appliance therapy. And the arch form should not be altered to a major extent because if the arch form is more altered to a major extent, there are more chances for the relapse to occur. And finally, the 10th theorem, which is nothing but added by Moyer, states that certain malocclusions require permanent retaining devices. We will be dealing in about specific malocclusion and the reta and retention regime for it in further slides. Raleigh and Williams, six keys to eliminate lower retention. There are six keys actually given by Raleigh Williams to prevent the retention in the lower arch. The first key is the incisor edges of the lower incisors should be placed at or 1 mm ahead of AP plane. Now this position ensures maximum stability for the lower incisors. Second key, the, uh, the apex of the lower incisor root should be more distal when compared to its crown. That means it should be diverging. The apex, the root and the crown. The apex of the root should be more diverging when compared to the crown and the laterals should be more diverging when compared to the centrals. The third key is the apex of the canine also should be diverging in a distal fashion when compared to its crown. The fourth key states that 
all the incisors should be lower incisors should be in same buccolingual plane that means they should not be either they should they should be placed mostly upright then only they will be in a same buccolingual plane and the fifth key states that the apex root apex of the lower canine must be more buccal when compared to its crown apex and finally the last key is the sixth key states that slenderization if required that is proximal stripping in the lower teeth must be done after completion of the orthodontic therapy which will help or aid in maintaining the stability of the corrected teeth first key is nothing but <clears throat> the incisor edges of the lower incisors must be placed at or one mm ahead of the ap line or the ap plane second the apex of the lower uh, the apex of the lower later incisors must be uh, more divergent or distally divergent when compared to its crown apex the centrals should be more divergent when compared to the laterals the third key states that the apex of the canine should be more should be distal when compared to its crown fourth key states that all the lower incisors must be in same buccolingual plane fifth key states that the apex of the root apex of the canine must be more buccal when compared to its crown and finally the last key sixth key states that slenderization if required it has to be done to maintain the stability of the corrected tree uh, of the lower teeth what are the various types of retention actually retention can be natural or no retention limited or short term retention prolonged or permanent retention based upon the corrected mal occlusion we have to plan retention for example natural or no retention is required in case of anterior crossbite since once the crossbite is corrected usually there are very less chances for uh, the relapse to occur posterior crossbites blocked out or highly placed canines once they are corrected usually require less uh, there is no need for retention and the last is nothing but serial extraction procedures limited or short term retention limited or short term retention is required in case of class 1 non extraction cases class 1 cases with deep bite class 2 division 1 and division 2 cases class 2 extraction cases and prolonged or permanent retention is required in case of midline diastema cases second correct uh, correction of severe rotations and certain class 2 division 1 and division 2 cases what are the retainers retainers are actually the appliances or the devices which are used to achieve retention there are two types of retainers they can be removable retainers or permanent retainers we will know in detail about this removable as well as permanent retainers first coming to removable retainers removable retainers are the retainers which are can be worn or removed by the will of the patient so they actually depends greatly on the patient's compliance the first removal retainer is the holly's appliance the holly's appliance was actually given by charles tweed in the year 1920 a very simple retainer which consists of adex clasps on the molar and labial bow the labial bow this labial bow can be altered or modified in a number of ways so simply in an ideal holly's appliance the labial bow extends from canine to canine but it can be modified to extend from premolar to premolar or directly the bow can be soldered to the bridge of the adex clasp apart from this also a number of modifications in the acrylic portion of the holly's appliance can also be done like it holly's appliance in along with anterior bite plate holly's appliance along with posterior bite plate all these combinations can be done with holly's appliance next coming to beg retainer beg retainer nothing but also consists of a labial bar but the thing is it extends till the last erected tooth curves around the last erected tooth and gets embedded in the acrylic it can be constructed till first molar it can be even constructed till the last erected molar also this has been actually introduced to overcome the drawback of holly's retainer that is there is crossover wires which are present in holly's appliance because of crossover wires there is there is lot of risk of opening up of again the spaces so here that problem is eliminated next coming to clip on retainer or spring spring aligner what is this clip clip on retainer or spring aligner we can see in the diagram that there is a labial wire running from the labial aspect of the incisors it curves uh, on the canine and then goes posteriorly uh, sorry on the lingual aspect and it even adapts the lingual aspect of the teeth that means there is a wire labially it then encircles the gingival portion of the canine goes on the lingual aspect and even adapts the lingual aspect of the teeth actually this clip on retainer and spring aligner to prevent any irritation this labial wire and the lingual wire there is a thin strip of acrylic which is present mostly this retainer is actually used to bring about bring about a little bit changes in the alignment of the teeth like if mild crowding is there then this retainer can even be used for bringing about corrections and when we want to use this retainer for this purpose first the teeth are properly aligned 
<coughs> on a wax setter and then this retainer is constructed on the wax setter and then it is delivered to the patient. Mild crowdings can be corrected with this retainer. Next, wrap around retainer. It is similar to clip-on retainer spring and anode. The only thing is here, the radial wire extends to the last erected tooth and then curves and then goes lingually and even uh, properly wrapped over the lingual aspect of all the teeth. Clip-on retainer spring aligner only extends till canine. Wrap around retainer extends to the last adapted tooth. Next is Kessling tooth positioner. It was introduced given by HD Kessling. It actually is made up of highly uh, thermoplastic rubber based material. This rubber based material covers a closure area labially, lingually and even extends 1 to 2 mm of gingival margin. Kessling tooth positioner is actually a very good retainer in maintaining the stability but since it extends over the crucial areas, there is a lot of chances for development of temporomandibular joint problems. Next is invisible retainers. Invisible retainers are made up of ultra thin thermoplastic material and is fabricated by using BioStar machine. Invisible retainers are usually easily accepted by the patient since it usually goes unnoticed. Next coming to fixed retainers. The main problem with the removable retainers is the compliance of the patient. They say they will wear but the patient usually doesn't wear the retainer which results in the occurrence of the relapse. So fixed retainers can be given in such patients. The first is the use of fixed appliance. Fixed appliance is nothing but the appliance which is used to bring about orthodontic treatment itself can be left in place as a retainer. The second is banded canine to canine retainer. Here we can see in the diagram that the canines are banded and a heavy case stainless steel wire is adapted over the lingual or the parietal aspect of the teeth and this is soldered to these bands. This is a very good retainer but it, is a, it requires a little bit lab procedures. Next is bonded lingual retainers. Bonded lingual retainers consist of directly bonding the retainer onto the parietal or the lingual aspect of the teeth. Here stainless steel wire or blue LG wire is most commonly used. Nowadays even prefabricated lingual bond retainers are also available. As you can see in the diagram, uh, the second diagram that is the, di uh, that is the picture of the intraoral picture of the patient indicates that lingual bonded retainer is being bonded on the lingual aspect of the teeth from canine to canine. Next is band and spur retainer. This is a retainer which is most commonly used after the correction of the Mal, uh, uh, teeth which is which was e either parietally placed or uh, uh, or either buccally placed and even after the correction of rotations. Let us take an example here. Uh, the teeth which first is central incisor, then lateral incisor, then canine. For example, if the lateral incisor was parietally placed, or let us take another example. If the lateral incisor is buccally placed, after the correction of the malocclusion, the lateral incisor is being drawn properly into the arch. Then the band and spur retainer is constructed in such a way that the teeth which is being corrected is first banded and then the spurs are soldered onto it and the spurs are placed in such a way that it will prevent the occurrence of relapse. Since in this diagram the lateral incisor was placed buccally, was actually um, present buccally after the correction it has been properly placed in the arch and then it is banded and then spurs are soldered on either side so that it rests on the parietal aspect of the adjacent teeth that is central incisor and the canine so that these spurs will again prevent the lateral incisor from going buccally. So this was all about retention and relapse in general. Now let us know that there are certain special considerations for specific malocclusions like class 2 malocclusion, class 3 malocclusion, deep bite and open bite. Let us first know what uh, special considerations in class 2 malocclusion. Class 2 skeletal malocclusion mostly occurs because of, uh, because of imbalance between the growth of the maxilla and mandible. And relapse following class 2 malocclusion usually occurs because of continuous abnormal growth of the maxilla. Overcorrection need to be done. It is a very common thing in these patients. Overcorrection has to be done to prevent the occurrence of malocclusion. But in order to restrict the abnormal growth, mostly the authors pre prefer use of head gaze. Because head gaze will restrict the growth of the maxilla along with intraoral, it is head gear along with an intraoral retainer. So head gear will prevent the excessive growth of the maxilla, the intraoral retainer will maintain the dentition in the correct place. Now these usually class 2, class 3 malocclusions, deep bite, open bite, skeletal malocclusions, they are usually to a greater extent depends upon the sex of the patient, maturity of the patient, their bone response, everything. Few authors even prefer to use activator or the bionator to prevent the occurrence of relapse. But the use of these functional appliances as retainers are usually indicated when orthodontic therapy is completed very early and we are expecting that the, that the abnormal growth will still continue. 
So to be on the safe side after the completion, the appliance itself is used as a retainer to prevent the occurrence of relapse. Next is class 3 malocclusion. Mostly class 3 malocclusions usually occur because of abnormal or excessive growth of the mandible. So to prevent the occurrence of this relapse, it is usually beneficial or it is usually advised to use chin cap along with an intraoral retainer. Apart from this, other appliances like FR3 appliance, um, reverse activator also helps um, uh, in the prevention or the, uh, or the occurrence of the relapse of the class 3 malocclusion. And these functional appliances are usually indicated when correction of the class 3 malocclusion is generally done at a very early age and we are expecting the abnormal growth uh, to occur even after the completion of the orthodontic therapy. Since class 3 malocclusions are usually treated at a very early age, that is as soon as the class 3 malocclusion is noticed, it has to be intercepted. So these malocclusions usually require prolonged or long time retention to be uh, done as a, uh, to be on a safe factor. Next coming to deep bite. Deep bite also usually occur, uh, relapse uh, and mostly the appliance which is used for the correction of deep bite is the anterior bite plate. The anterior bite plate for correction of deep bite is constructed in such a way that when the lower incisors comes in contact with the bite plate, there is uh, a crucial clearance between upper and lower teeth so that the lower teeth erupts okay, and the deep bite gets corrected. These, this appliance itself can be used as a maintenance of the retainer devices after the correction of the deep bite. But the thing is the height of the bite plate should be reduced so that there is proper good intercuspation between upper and the lower teeth. Next is open bite. Relapse following open bite can be occur mainly by two reasons. It can either by intrusion of the anteriors or it can either by supra eruption of the posteriors. Intrusion of the anteriors can occur mostly by if the child is indulging in abnormal habits like sucking, thumb sucking and uh, uh, lip biting etc. So these habits have to be intercepted to prevent the occurrence or uh, relapse of the treated open bite case. And in case of supra eruption of posteriors, the best method to prevent supra eruption of posteriors is to use hypo headgear. If the hypo headgear is used, it will prevent the posteriors to gain supra erupt. And also a posterior bite plate can be used. Posterior bite plate will also prevent the supra eruption of posteriors. This was all about special considerations in retention of certain malocclusions. Thank you.